it's time for us to get started. I would like to um, take a few minutes to just welcome you all to this important seminar entitled The Importance of Mental Health Care in Pre and Post Transplant Patients. Um, uh, my name is Sylvia Carbert. I will, I'm, I, I see I'm a moderator here today. So I'm your moderator and I'm a social worker with transplant services for about the past 17 years. My uh, frontline work has involved both recipient and living donor in multiple programs. And now as the team lead, I'm also across the organ groups. So, um, so we would like to begin by acknowledging, uh, doing a land acknowledgement. The University of Alberta acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory uh, and respects the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. To um, introduce Michelle Hounslow, who is our guest speaker today. And she is a transplant recipient, a kidney patient from a living unrelated donor. She is an organ donation advocate, a parent, and an active person who dealt with chronic, mental, chronic health issues for three decades before receiving her kidney transplant. When Michelle had her transplant, her daughter was only three years old and Michelle had to quickly recognize the importance of taking care of her own mental health and creating a support network that carried her through her years of chronic illness, through her transplant experience and to the present. So we know we're in a time where our mental health issues and psychosocial issues are also uh, pertinent for many uh, transplant of our transplant recipients. So we're just delighted to have Michelle with us. And with all that, I will turn it over to Michelle. Thank you, Sylvia. Thanks so much for moderating. Um, thanks to everybody for joining us today. Um, my hope is just that sharing my transplant story um, enriches everybody's understanding of pr this particular aspect, the mental health aspect um, of patients' transplant experiences. And I will acknowledge that every transplant experience is uh, unique to, its, to itself, um, to each person. Um, th there will be time for questions at the end. There's a few questions that I'm going to pose during my presentation um, directly related to uh, transplant recipients. So if you are a recipient and you're here today, um, take note of those or just think about how you might answer them because I'd love to hear some other feedback from recipients in the audience today. Uh, so I am just going to go ahead and share my screen and uh, bring up something so there's a little bit more visual than just looking at me today. Um, Okay, so hopefully that is sharing for everybody. Um, okay, so yeah, welcome. I am Michelle Hounslow. Um, first thing I will do, uh, my de declaration of uh, conflict of interest. Um, I do not have any conflict of interest and I don't discuss any um, off-brand drugs or devices. Um, pardon me one moment. I'm just going to move this so I can see my screen. Um, so um, we did do a land acknowledgement for Treaty 7, which is where obviously uh, ATI is located, but I just want to leave up um, a quick acknowledgement for the um, vast array of nations that are here in the Treaty 7 region, because I am in the Calgary area, um, specifically northwest of Calgary. Uh, so I have a different land, land acknowledgement up here just to um, recognize our uh, rich nations around here. Uh, another thing I want to do is just um, offer some personal acknowledgements because, as I say, and as you'll hear me say a few times, um, each transplant experience is unique to the other. So there's a few things that I wanted to highlight, first of all, um, that that were important to me and that are things that I feel fortunate to. Uh, one thing is being able to access uh, quality health care here in Alberta um, and in Canada, uh, particularly. Uh, where I am, I've received great care um, and I'm able to receive great care as a white woman. 
Um, another thing is that I was fortunate not to ever have to be on dialysis. Um, for those of you who know about dialysis or have um, had experience with dialysis, uh, often you can be tied to um, tied to the necessities of schedules and dialysis supplies, and that really has an impact on life. So I was fortunate not to have to go through that. I was also fortunate to uh, find a donor fairly quickly. This is myself and my um, longtime friend, Craig, who ended up being my living unrelated donor. Um, so I wasn't on a wait list for a long time. I didn't have to do an extensive search for a donor, uh, for a donor donated kidney. And that's something I recognize I'm fortunate for, um, as well as family and friends that I have uh, that I have along the way. This is me and my siblings here. This is one of the only pictures I'm allowed to to share that I think uh, no one will get upset about. Um, so, what I'm going to go through obviously is a little bit about my background. Sylvia introduced a little bit um, my my experience with um, mental illness and chronic health issues that impacted my kidney began in childhood. Um, so I'm gonna talk about that, also my mental health throughout my life, including um, my childhood my childhood illness, going through various diagnoses, um, when my uh, illness went into remission and then the times pre and post transplant. Um, I also am adding in here a little bit of information just from casual conversations and very informal polls um, about experiences with mental health through transplant experiences for people that have had transplant um, transplants in various parts of the world that I've been fortunate to get to know, just to give kind of a little bit of a broader perspective. Uh, the impact of organ failure um, and transplants and how that impacts us all, and then long-term mental health uh, post-transplant. So I'll be talking a little bit about how how I how I struggled, but also how I um, supported myself. So I'm going to start with uh, the childhood story um, of just me there. You'll see me as a, as a kid, just living a normal, healthy life. This was me pre-diagnosis. Um, a few things to know about me. So this is, you know, this is a typical life. Um, as you'll be able to see, I was quite uh, a wonderful artist, you can see there. Um, I had an excellent fashion sense. That's me sitting in the chair there with my sister standing beside me. I had some wonderful ski tricks as well. Uh, so I had, a, I had a great childhood growing up with my parents, um, three siblings in the home as well. And then all of a sudden symptoms appeared for me, including fatigue, uh, intense stomach pains and also purple lesions like a rash on um, my arms, legs, elbows, ankles, things like that. Um, so that basically turned my my childhood, as you can see here. Um, this is the you know the first decade or so of my life. All of a sudden, I was dealing with uh, medical procedures, a diagnosis, a misdiagnosis. Um, tests and hospital stays, missing school, missing out on activities, being away from my family and friends, um, damage to my kidneys. So I was actually, um, as these symptoms were investigated, I was misdiagnosed, first of all, with um, HSP or Henox online papura. Um, but then my illness came back and it was um, re-diagnosed as a very, very rare autoimmune disorder, disorder called um, Poly arteritis nodosa. So that led to um, more medical procedures, hospital stays, uh, treatment. So I went through a number of years being on things like cyclosporin and prednisone in my youth um, and just dealing with that. So while I don't remember specifically um, dealing with depression as a child and into my teenage years, um, I have no doubt that it obviously impacted me. I do recall all of what I've said before dealing with hospital stays, missing my family and friends, missing out on school. Um, that obviously has an impact um, on a developing child and, and their mental health. Um, so I would just draw your attention to the pictures that are kind of surrounding me here. For some reason, I have these in my possession. These are um, these are from you know renal imaging from when I was when I was a child. And these are the kind of things that are on those plastic sheets that you would use on overhead projectors. And I'm not sure if overhead projectors still exist, but um, if you can think of the last time you actually used a, an overhead projector, I was diagnosed well before that time. So um, medical imaging and things have definitely changed since then, but this became kind of the picture of my life for a while. 
Um, I was fortunate uh, in my later teenage years to go into remission and remain that way um, until this day, actually. So I was fortunate for that. Graduated high school, um, you know, moved into uh, early adulthood. And but one of the things was I was still dealing with with mental health issues that I was not addressing. Um, and I also ended up with high blood pressure, which I which I didn't take care of and I didn't respect and understand the connection between um, having high blood pressure that's untreated and the kidney damage. So, um, you know, that's just part of my being young, not understanding the impact of my illness on me, which then of course led to further kidney damage. Um, so once the, once my experience with the chronic illness, once it had gone into remission, I was fortunate to have um, a pretty fairly typical adult life, um, going to university, um, you know, celebrating babies, weddings, uh, birthdays, things with families and families and friends. I lived in New Zealand for a year. Um, I discovered my love for the Rocky Mountains where I lived for a number of years. Um, I worked, I traveled, and I took up hobbies. Um, and during this time, I eventually, eventually, I was diagnosed with clinical depression. Um, but for many years, it went untreated. I wasn't seeing anyone to support me with that. I wasn't on any medication. So, um, you know, essentially, I was dealing with underlying untreated depression for much of this time as well. Um, the pictures show smiley events that I've chose to highlight. But again, uh, behind the smiles, behind the pictures, behind the things people are doing, there's often things hiding back there that we don't necessarily see. Uh, so in the years before my actual transplant, I was still in remission, um, but due to high blood pressure that was not controlled, my kidney damage, and, and just aging in general, my kidney damage um, increased. So my EGFR was going down. Um, so eventually I... I was responsible and took uh, control of my, my health, my mental health um, in ways that worked out for me treating my high blood pressure as well. Um, and then I found myself in adulthood, I was expecting a child and growing my family. Um, I will preface this by saying that I would do it all in, in a second um, to end up with the child that I have. Um, but because of my low kidney function, I was considered high risk um, I was supported by my nephrologist. Um, he referred me to the high risk clinics for maternal fetal medicine and internal medicine. I was well looked after, had multiple um, appointments, but, you know, the combination of a high risk pregnancy along with um, underlying, you know, depressive, depressive episodes and having mental illness, um, couple that with, you know, the risk of a premature birth, um, and my daughter was also diagnosed in utero with a kidney issue of her own, um, unrelated to mine. And I will say she had surgery at eight months and she's she's healthy now. But all of that compounded to be um, an incredibly stressful time for me during my pregnancy. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, a big challenge. I And I, like I say, I was dealing with, I was on appropriate medication for um, for my depression, for my high blood pressure, for, for other things that were happening in my life. And then eventually the, um, the pregnancy turned into a NICU stay for my, for my daughter, but eight years later, she's, she's doing quite well, but, um, you go through all these experiences in life and sometimes the, the stress of them adds up and that compounds the mental health struggles we have. Um, so a few years um, after my, my um, daughter was born, my kidney health really got to a critical point. My kidney function was quite low. Um, and my nephrologist said, okay, it's time to uh, determine if you are going to be eligible for a transplant uh, first and second to start looking for, um, for a kidney donor from a living donor. And um, he was, my nephrologist at the time was really, really supportive. Um, he was confident and he reassured me that I would be able to find um, a kidney donor before I would have to go on dialysis. Uh, so then we get into um, my mental health pre-transplant. So this is, while I have um, a young child, I had a traveling, uh, my partner traveled for work at the time. Um, and then if you have been a part of the transplant world in any way, a lot of us, you know, various, various um, experiences ourselves. 
you go through uh, everything here where first I was tested to see if I was eligible to, to actually have a transplant, uh, which I was. I reached out to family and friends who had previously told me that they would um, love to be tested to be a donor for me when that time came, uh, because I, I, you know, I knew for, for years that my kidney health was declining and that a kidney transplant was likely in my future. Uh, so Craig, my eventual kidney donor was the first person to be tested. He tested wonderfully, um, and was a really great match. And we got to the point, you know, eventually after, after a lot of time, a lot of testing on his part and my part, uh, we got to the final cross-match test with the, the image there. I think in the background, there's 18 or 19 vials that that have to be filled up for that final cross-match test before um, we went ahead with surgery. Another unique part of my story is that my nephrologist um, always had the question in mind of when is the ideal time to have a transplant? Uh, for some people, that's a strange question, but for me... Um, Knowing now in particular, my nephrologist knew that uh, once you have once you have a transplant, there are almost as many, if not more things that you have to worry about um, and take care of and think about uh, after your transplant side effects of medication, um, healing from your surgery, our susceptibility to um, infections and viruses and illnesses, um, our increased risk risk of uh, skin and other cancers. So, once you get on the other side of a transplant and have one, there's still things you have to be concerned about um, and that that take its toll on you. So my nephrologist didn't want me to um, go ahead too soon. But then again, you don't want to wait too long and have the um, end stage kidney failure, in my case, doing more damage. So there was a, a fine balancing act of that. Um, and then I get to the point where I'm where I'm waiting. I've been tested. My donor has been tested. Um, but during this time, I have declining um, mental and physical health for, for a variety of reasons related to transplant and not. Um, like I mentioned, I was raising a toddler. Uh, my partner was traveling a lot. So while I did have family and friends close by, I was doing a lot of solo parenting at that time. Um, I went on medical leave from work. There was still this uncertainty about timing and how everything was going to go. Uh, ended up having some complications related to some GI symptoms. Uh, so complications had to be ruled out um, before they could say, okay, now we're ready to pick a date for your transplant. And just the just the sheer um, exhaustion of things. I, I went through that time pre-transplant where I was always on, on guard. I was always in energy saving mode. Um, I had to be sure that I had enough energy to get through the next activity or the next hour or the day. Um, and that has kind of carried through to this post-transplant life for me as well, where I find myself still kind of defaulting to protecting my energy. And whether that's just kind of a carryover from pre-transplant where that was my survival mode for for a number of years is just energy saving and making sure that I make it through and I don't tire myself out. Um, some of it's just carryover, but some of it is also the reality of just my, my energy levels at the moment um, and how I can actually uh, make it through. Some days are more tiring than others, even now post-transplant. So I became the queen of um, looking, finding ways where I could look after my daughter um, while I was lying down or sitting down and I could preserve my energy, but still be engaging with her. So um, yeah, parenting a toddler during that time was, was a big challenge, but it was all part of this, this big picture. And I had things to look forward to. Um, so I want to jump over to, like I, like I mentioned, I'll make it very clear that this was a very informal poll that I took. Um, I reached out to some friends of mine that I know uh, that I've been fortunate to meet since my transplant um, around the world in places like England, uh, USA, Finland, uh, India, Australia, various places. So I posed some questions to them. Um, just to just to get different perspectives on how um, how transplant experiences affected them, particularly in mental health. Um, let me go here. So the first question I asked was, um, what was or is the aspect of your personal organ transplant experience that negatively negatively impacted your mental health? So 
answers from that. Some of these are my answers. Some of these are from friends of mine. Um, they range from fear of rejection or experiencing rejection, high expectations, um, misinformation, um, urgency of, of your transplant, the waiting for transplants, being abandoned by family or friends, which was a real thing for some people, work and family pressure. Um, the second question that I posed was, what, if anything, was missing from your transplant experience uh, that would have supported or improved your mental health? Um, so answers on that from these friends of mine included lack of mental health support through their transplant centers, uh, lack of support and guidance about starting life again or rebuilding your life after a transplant, uh, feeling the pressure to get back to normal, pressure to make the most of your new life. Um, another thing that I also found um, for me was a lack of peer support. Um, now post-transplant, I have a wonderful support system of people who have experienced transplant themselves, and there's really nothing like that um, for discussing your experience for people who, who have been through something um, similar. Um, so the final question that I asked was, uh, what were some of the things that you did for yourself that supported um, or improved your mental health throughout your organ transplant experience? And so some of these included um, CBT and therapy, mindfulness, meditation, um, giving oneself grace and permission to just accept what's happening, breathing exercises, socialization, uh, mental health care or medication, adjusting expectations, letting go of control, setting goals, um, and doing physical activity. So a number of those in, in the end there, that's a lot of things that, um, that I put into place for myself to support my own mental health. Um, so the impact of organ failure and going through transplants, um, this is again, I got some, some feedback and some ideas from friends of mine, and uh, there's definitely going to be some things missing here, but, um, and again, everybody's experience is unique, but we're talking about things like uh, work, feeling the work pressure, uh, facing one's own mortality, uh, loss of relationships, uh, whether that's friends or family, wondering if uh, the surgery and the experience itself will be worth it and how that will all go. Um, urgency of transplants and treatment, um, uncertainty, how my health and transplant surgery will impact my family and friends. Like that's been mentioned. Um, my daughter was barely three at the time of my transplant. Uh, my parents lived down the road from me at the time and were immediately following my transplant. My daughter lived with my parents for probably two and a half months. So while my partner was working and sometimes he was away working and I was just not capable um, of fully parenting day in and day out while I was still recovering, uh, my daughter lived with my parents and she's, you know, she remembers that fondly, but it's definitely an impact on myself, um, my partner, my daughter, my parents. And so how will this whole experience impact my family and friends? Uh, managing expectations was um, a big thing for me as well. Um, social aspects. One of the things that I found is when I was um, waiting for my transplant and experiencing just uh, exhaustion and brain fog and being a person that I just really didn't recognize. I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to socialize. I didn't want to make, I particularly didn't want to make new friends. Uh, I found it quite tiring to have to explain or to make excuses. If I, if I ended up not being able to follow through with plans, I just, I just didn't want to go there. Um, so while I did have social support, um, I just didn't want to extend my circle any further. And I always wondered, did I miss out on things that way? But it was a way of preserving um, what I had in that moment. Uh, moving to a new medical team was not something that I really realized would happen, but I had a wonderful nephrologist and nurse and their team, um, and I trusted them and I got to know them and then I was moving on from them. While the, the transition has been totally fine, it's still something that I had to adjust to. Um, medical trauma is a big one for a lot of us, I'm sure. Um, financial stress, uh, family pressure hospital stays and how you deal with those misinformation and misunderstanding both within ourselves and with um, the community, family and friends. Um, there's there's tons of things that people don't know about organ transplants and, and health and things like that. Um, what will the results of surgery be like and how will I heal? 
again, the fear of organ rejection or experiencing rejection um, weighs on a lot of us. How do I, how do I thank my, how do I thank my donor? Um, he's, he's a living, he's still living. He's my living donor. He's a good friend of mine, but I still struggle with, um, have I honored his gift enough at times? Um, and then side effects of treatment and the immunosuppressants. Um, we, we know about this. There's some really hard side effects, um, that are long lasting. Some take time to get used to, one of the things that I found really unfair was that one of the medications that I take makes me lose hair on my head, but there's other medications that make me grow hair on my face or, you know, it's just, it just seems unfair at times. So there's, this is just an, this is not an exhaustive list of the impact of organ failure and transplants, but um, there's a lot that happens for us during this time. Uh, so really we get to how did I support my own mental health and what did I do when I found myself depressed? So there were a number of things that were, were important to me. Um, some of them will be fairly universal, but there's a few that are very particular to me. Um, uh, so the people that I had in my life, family, friends, like I mentioned, my parents were living close by, um, peers and colleagues. I had, um, I had a great support system in that way, and I feel fortunate for that. Um, access to mental health care and medications. I was seeing a renal psychiatrist through my transplant clinic. I was also seeing a psychologist. And I also um, attended a coping skills workshop through my transplant center. Um, and I also was on and still am on medication um, throughout times in my adulthood. It just became clear that medication for me was, a, was something that was going to be a lifelong way to support my own mental health and um, just the way I need my certain medications for my transplant or for other um, chronic health issues I deal with. Medications for my mental health are an important factor in um, in my own well-being. Um, another important thing for me was planning for the future, whether it was work or school or travel, um, doing things with my family. This image in particular was from um, a plan that I made for the future of, uh, with the hopes of attending the World Transplant Games, which uh, I was very fortunate to attend those World Transplant Games in um, 2019 in England to represent Canada there. So that's one of the images from the very beginning of that. So planning for the future and looking forward to things was a really important thing for me. Um, rest, energy, it was a big focus of mine, uh, maintaining, maintaining what I had to do, being a parent, balancing everything um, throughout that time. So rest was very important to me. Um, and also a little bit of a sense of humor sometimes. This is, uh, this is well before COVID times, well before masks were, um, were in the world in this way that they are, they have been. Uh, my daughter was quite sick and I just, I just did not want to get what she had from her. So we were resting and I masked up as well. Um, and another very important thing, kind of the center of it all for me was, uh, was gratitude and, uh, just looking for things to be thankful for. Um, when you look at these other things, the, the people planning for the future, rest, um, mental health care, um, a lot of those things were outside of my control. I couldn't control who was there when. I couldn't control necessarily when I would get to rest and recover. Planning for the future is, is something that you're, that you're planning, right? You don't have uh, control over that in the moment. I couldn't always get um, an appointment with any of my mental health care providers uh, if I needed it immediately, but gratitude was something that I had control over um, and could really, really make a difference for me. Uh, so I found some, uh, some really amazing quotes uh, by Michael J. Fox, starting with gratitude makes optimism sustainable. And another thing that he said that really stands out to me, and I'll explain why after, but another thing that he said is, um, I'm going to just move this out of the way so I can see all of it. Another thing is, if you don't think you have anything to be grateful for, keep looking because you don't just receive optimism. You can't wait for things to be great and then be grateful for them. You've got to behave in a way that promotes that. Uh, so the way this worked for me is exactly that. Um, you can't just wait for good things to happen. You can't just wait for your transplant to start your life again, or at least that was that was my viewpoint anyways, that was my experience. So I had to actively go out and look for things um, that, would, that would keep positivity top of mind 
but genuine positivity um, is what I was looking for. So I had to go out and find those things and make sure that I actually uh, remembered what was worth living for, um, what I was working towards and things like that. Um, so, so I started a daily gratitude practice, um, and I started a social media account related to that, which, uh, really supported what I wanted to do with this. So I, uh, it was a way for me to share. And I mean, really, it was also just a way for myself to find one to three things every day that I could be, uh, that I could be grateful for. And so these are just some of the examples that I came up with, um, a lot of them were not big things. Some of them were uh, small things like being thankful that my dad came over and planted a sunflower in our yard. Uh, another thing I really remember thinking about was I am, I was very grateful because I was not on dialysis. I didn't have the fluid restrictions that um, those patients on dialysis have. So I could hydrate myself. I could um, drink as much water throughout those hot summer days as I wanted. So it's it's little things like that, going to the farmer's market, remembering that I can move my body and I should move my body. Um, I had a beautiful west facing backyard with beautiful sunsets. Um, another major thought for me was because I was uh, not working at the time, I had this time to be with my daughter in her very early years and connect with her and be with her and um, be a big part of, of her life, particularly then. And then of course, the, the theme, one of the themes of me is, uh, is rest and just making sure that I was rested and looking after myself. Uh, so then we get to my transplant day. So that was all the stuff that I did pre-transplant. A lot of it is carried, um, over to post-transplant and how I support my mental health. But so this was, you know, the day before the day of and leaving the hospital uh, in 2018 in May. So I was I went into the transplant feeling uh, quite good. Um, I wasn't really worried. I was confident in uh, in my donor, in my surgical team. I felt really good going into it. Uh, there is Craig uh, front, middle, center, uh, my donor, and his family was there, which was amazing for him and amazing for me to see that he had that support as well. Uh, so we went into the surgery and then uh, we were such a great match. Things went really, really well. Um, and four days later, I was able to go home and then um, continue the whole journey still and get onto the really hard work of what was then um, healing from the transplant. So once I got home, um, the priorities that I had laid out the ways that I supported my mental health, they carried on as well. But I identified some other things here, which uh, you can see in front of you here. I, I gave myself the permission to just turn off, to not answer phones, to not make plans, to not um, be on social media, um, to rest when I needed it, to, to, um, to express my needs and what I needed to, to do for myself. So I gave myself permission to just to just heal and do what I needed. I created consistency. Um, like I had mentioned, my daughter was at my parents' house. So daily visits when that allowed, um, I paid attention to my medications. I followed up with the doctor, all those appointments and blood tests that you have to have right away in the weeks and months following, following your transplant. I was really consistent with that. Um, eating well, resting, uh, looking after myself and then getting up and going outside. So this particular picture of us on the chair there, that's, um, you know, in the, in the week or two following my transplant, this park was like, you know, six, 800 meters from my house. Um, my friends that were visiting at the time, my partner, my daughter, we went down to the park, they brought a comfy chair for me to sit on and we got outside and I spent some time, um, with my family and my friends that way. So, following up and and doing all those little things that you know that um, that help you move forward. Uh, that third picture there is what I wrote on my bathroom mirror uh, in about September. So about four months after my transplant, um, I started to get a little bit frustrated with my with my healing, how things were going, how I was adjusting or not adjusting to certain side effects of my medication. Um, it was, it was a challenge. So I, I had to just remind myself to have realistic expectations and just, you know, look after myself and move ahead. 
Um, and then finally, one of the things that was um, important to me was physical activity and getting back into the water and uh, getting back to swimming, which was a huge part of things for me. Um, that's actually a picture. I think I'm the far swimmer near the top of the picture. Um, that's at the World Transplant Games uh, in England in 2019. So these were um, these were somewhat new things post-transplant compared to what I did for myself pre-transplant, but all important things nonetheless. Uh, and then I get to the point of, you know, where I am, where I am now um, in the years following transplant. Uh, what I've come to to get into is, you know, looking, making sure I'm meeting certain goals of mine, whether that was going to the World Transplant Games or furthering my career, um, working on relationships that I had. Uh, I became um, really, really active uh, in uh, organ and tissue donation awareness by being involved with the Canadian Transplant Association, um, being involved in local events, and uh, I'm currently working towards organizing the second annual Green Shirt Day event, which is, um, for us here in Cochrane, where I live, is a a ball hockey tournament um, that we're going to be doing annually to honor uh, Logan Boulay and his gift of life and his organ donation legacy. So uh, that's coming up April 7th. I'm going to throw in a little shout out for Green Shirt Day and uh, wearing green and talking about and supporting organ donation awareness uh, for coming up on April 7th. Um, I connected with people around the world um, and Canada who have had uh, organ transplants and I've learned many, many different stories of how things have gone for them, how things work in different countries, uh, every little intricacy that happens uh, during one's transplant experience. And that's been a really important thing for me, um, as I mentioned before, connecting with people who have um, been through something similar. Um, and then you'll you'll notice here, there's pictures of me um, paddle boarding and swimming and being in the water. And that's a, that's a big thing for me. That's kind of why the background of my presentation has been water drops. Water is a big grounding factor for me um, and an important thing for me. So um, that, yeah, that is my experience. That's, you know, as much as I can, can sum up my experience with uh, particularly mental health um, in my transplant experience. And hopefully that, you know, some of you can recognize yourselves in some of there. Um, as we mentioned before, it's uh, it's question time. So if you have questions for me, I welcome those. I also, I'd love to hear um, from the recipients who are here today, if you have any thoughts on your own mental health experiences uh, through the, this time, or if you have answers to these questions that I posed, um, yeah, please feel free to share and, uh, and ask away. And I... There we go. Thank you so much, Michelle, for that uh, inspirational story of re resilience and hope. And so, yes, please uh, throw in your questions for Michelle and Sean and I will do our best to, to moderate. I just... Thank you so much, Michelle. That was awesome. So, so good. Um, I, I love the Daily Gratitude Journal. Um, I don't do it to the same extent you do, but I do um, take a lot of photographs. Um, sunsets, sunrises, um, you know, things that kind of set your day on a on an even trajectory. But the other one that I really liked was, uh, you know, not not playing mental games with yourself, but um, having a, a way that you uh, you you decide I'm going to, you know, make it make something new or do something new, um, you know, and and making it something intentional. It's a really funny. Uh, um, analogy but uh, if anyone remembers the 2008 movie yes man with jim carrey um he has to say yes to absolutely everything um i literally did that in my head um for a period of time and uh and it got me invited to uh well sorry it meant i wasn't going to turn down um going to christmas dinner um after i'd been through a divorce and was sitting on the wait list on dialysis and and uh you know and i i did i met a lot of new people um just doing that kind of a, an intentionality, uh, you know, I need to intentionally look after myself today, or I need to intentionally, um, you know, branch out and get off the couch or, or uh, get out of my house. So yeah. that's just excellent. Thank you, Michelle. 
Thanks, Sean. I do, I do want to note too, like, I know that sometimes positivity can become a negative or toxic and things like that. So I do want to really emphasize that for me, this was, this was a genuine activity that I did to, to say, okay, I'm lucky today. I'm lucky because I have a donor. I'm lucky because, you know, it's, it's sun, you know, like it was legit, legitimately genuine things that I could be, that I could focus on. So um, that was, that, like I said, that was really important for me and it did a lot for my mental health. Uh, it's Karen Johnston. I, I'm a nurse practitioner in pediatric transplant, but I just came as a manager from addiction and mental health. And I really want to thank you for seeing what you did um, because it's an area I think sometimes we overlook um, and don't give people enough resources. And I know probably everybody's not from Alberta, but I did put in the chat, there's some really good resources that you can access. And if you're from different provinces, if you just Google search, there's there's so much out there, people have no idea and they want to connect with you. So well done. Thank you so much. I appreciate hearing that. I'm trying to think of if there's anything that I skipped over as well. I think I covered most of what I wanted to talk about, but um, like I said, if there's anyone that wants to share um, questions to those, answers to those questions I posed, um, they're very, you know, it was interesting having those conversations with the people that I did um, and seeing different perspectives, not just from Canada, but from around the world. Uh, there was a, a woman that I met, I met her online and then we met at the World Transplant Games in 2019. She's from Finland. And she taught me about something called Scandia Transplant, and it's a it's a collaborative organization between uh, let me find it Norway, Sweden, Finland, Iceland, Denmark, and Estonia. So uh, transplant recipients from those countries, they're all they're all put together on this Scandia Transplant uh, list, and they get put to the top of the list for about three days when it's their time and when they're urgently urgently needing it. This woman that I met, um, fantastic athlete, super amazing, uh, amazing person as well. So she needed a liver transplant. She was on the top of the list for those three days. And at the very last moment, um, she has the three days to be on the top of the list and then they move on to the next person. And at that point, mm -hmm. life is really up in the air unless something else happens. So it's interesting to see the way that other countries and other places um, deal with the need for transplants and transplant lists and this kind of collaborative effort, as well as the feedback that I got from a lot of friends that mental health supports just didn't exist for them. Uh, peer support, like I mentioned, was a was a struggle for me beforehand. Now, uh, I've been fortunate to have some uh, some great connections and great relationships that I've built. Um, Jan is one of them who's here and I see she's she wrote in the comments um, I found journal, journaling was very therapeutic too gratitude and finding purpose in every day was key to my post transplant journey as well so I will admit my gratitude has fallen off a little bit um, but it is still an important thing it's uh it's very uh, apropos you mentioned Scandia transplant because we had a speaker last Thursday um, for this seminar that we co-hosted with the Western Canada Children's Heart Network, um, and it was, his name was Dr. Thomas Moeller, and he's from Norway, and he spoke about Scandia transplant. <laughs> yeah, I started a new job last week, so I wasn't around for that, but it is, it's, it's quite an impressive program, so it's interesting to see what, what we can learn from, from uh, other places. I just appreciate so much, Michelle, how you've spoken to the experience of I mean, it's just resonate resonates for us as social workers here. I mean, we're in Edmonton, and um, you know the challenges of uh, of maintaining that mental health support for our patients, and mm -hmm. uh, that you have so well articulated what it's been like to go through the pre, during, and post, mm -hmm. and uh, and just uh, I just want to say I really appreciate that and all the work you're doing to promote promote what our patients need and so I just thank you so much thanks Sylvia I appreciate hearing that too 
Do we have other questions? Oh, we have one from Patricia. You mentioned the pressure to get back to normal. Could you elaborate on that? And where is that pressure coming from? Uh, yeah, so that one of the that answer was partly mine, but it also did come from a friend of mine. Um, so the pressure to get back to normal, uh, I think if I speak from my experience, the pressure to get back to normal for me was um, returning to work, you know, eventually when when was that going to happen returning to being a parent if I had my daughter down the road at my parents house. Um, that was just the way it had to be for that time. And I remember speaking to my psychi my psychiatrist at the time um, about the pressure that I felt uh, not knowing when I would be well enough to have my daughter in my care full time all day every day again, especially with my my partner traveling so the pressure to get back to normal to return to work or to return to you know physical activity or activities that you did um, return to like volunteer roles that you've that you've been part of uh, parenting you know the pressure to get back to normal um, especially if you go through uh, you know some challenges or struggles after your transplant is uh, can be pretty high um, and a lot of it, I mean, I think a lot of it for me was internal. It wasn't coming from anybody else. It wasn't my parents asking. Um, my daughter definitely asked when she could come home, but, you know, she did understand even at that age that I was not in a place where I could look after her just yet, but it would come. So um, where that pressure came from, a lot of it was internal pressure, I would say. I think the other internal pressure, and you mentioned it right in your talk, Michelle, um, is that honoring the gift. Um, there's a there's a motivating factor, um, but also sometimes an overwhelming factor of, especially with living donation, but even deceased donation too, of knowing someone has, you know, done this, you know, unrepayable um, thing for you. And, uh, and it, it is a different kind of pressure, but it is um, just kind of tacked onto that entire list. Uh, your one slide where it was just words and, you know, hair loss and hair growth and uh, family and children and all, all those different kinds of things. It was such a good um representation of just the myriad of things um that you know sit both as pressures uh but also uh you know just factors that uh, you know compound the, your story that make your mental health journey just a little different than someone who maybe hasn't gone through the transplant journey yeah absolutely yeah um, jan did post here too um a question about did anyone access the kidney foundation peer support program pre or post transplant and i know um, uh, if she wants to jump on, I don't know, but I know that she is, uh, referring to the Kidney Foundation, particularly to Canada, because I know, um, I believe that Jan herself has been part of that, um, I know post-transplant for herself as being a peer support that would, um, you know, take calls and take questions from people and provide that peer support. I myself didn't, uh, didn't access it, um, pre-transplant, and now that I'm post-transplant, I, I have, um, a a created network of my own uh, in there for those kind of things. So, hi, Donna. Hi. We have a I, was just, I was just going to mention too, there's also the pressure from um, the misunderstandings that friends and family have. You have a transplant, you're alive, you're back to normal. Mm -hmm. And yeah. yes, you may be walking, talking, and at home, but you still have a schedule of appointments of PT and you have X amount of energy and spoons you're going to spend that day. Yeah. It, it, it's not normal. Mm -hmm. Well, and they perceive it. Yeah. And a, a transplant is a treatment, not a cure. Um, exactly. The not under, people not understanding um, and, you know, maybe why would they, but the long-term effects and having to be, on those medications for life and that once you get this this organ it's not necessarily there forever it's not it's not you know it's not curing you it's not you know there's there's that's why i mentioned the timing for me with my nephrologist is there's all these things that you have to take into consideration because it's it's not just you get a transplant and everything is better and yeah there's a lot it's a lot more complicated than that you're right donna <laughs> exactly and i think part of that is Alberta hasn't really done a public awareness campaign that supports organ donation. Green Shirt Day is the first venture into organ donation signups. And mm -hmm. 
it's a slow start off the ground, I think. Yeah. That's, and it, that's my, my opinion. Then there's the whole education of the transplant, what I call the transplant lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Th those are two different things. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a whole other topic that, you know, other, uh, other yourself or other transplanted people have that, um, the specific lifestyle, right? You, there's so much we have to be careful of and that we have to do. Um, I myself, I'm still doing uh, blood tests every three months. You know, it changes. It's different for everybody. Um, I have a, a friend going through a procedure that he likely never would have had to have had he not had a transplant and the medications and stuff. So it's, it's really, it can be a nonstop um, post-transplant life as well. I was literally just at the hospital this morning doing my blood work. I see we have a hand up from Punita with a question. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Hi, Michelle. Really nice to meet you. I'm a, a transplant hepatologist. So really beautiful talk and, and you just led us through so nicely pre and post transplant, how important it is to have so many supports. I just wonder if you could speak to, you know, from a physician perspective, if you could just speak about um, how we can do better, uh, I guess, during our visits with uh, with with patients pre-transplant, post-transplant, what are the things, we have limited time, but what are the things that we can do well um, when we're interacting with uh, with with you? And yeah, others? well, thanks. Thank you for that uh, and for being here. Um, I it, I do recognize the the time limitations and I I have found, you know, there's there's often a separation in the physical health care versus the, the mental health care. Um, for myself, like I said, I did access uh, a coping skills workshop with the social workers here in Calgary. So that was beneficial. So that didn't necessarily, um, it wasn't directly with the physicians themselves, but it was in coordination with them. Um, you know, having, having a checklist, having, you know, are you guys trained in going through the, the depression checklist of saying, could you take those couple minutes with people and just say, you know, does this apply to you? Does this apply to you? Does this at, at different times during you know, pre-transplant, post-transplant as well, just to identify, because some people are able to be and confident to be vocal about their needs and their mental health. Some people are not, um, some people are not unless they're asked. So even just working that in, in a small way in the, in the physician part of things and just saying, we recognize this as being important and we want to track changes in you as well. Um, that would be a thought for me, but, um, and just, just being aware of it and noticing changes in, in the person themselves. And uh, that's a thought that I have, but yeah, I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts as well as, as recipients, that's helpful too. I, I'd almost add, especially at the milestone points when you are first mm -hmm talking wait list when you're um, first getting transplanted, when you're, you know, first going to dialysis even and, and losing a transplant. I mean, just recognize that those are huge things and nobody's handling it well. Um, I think we all, I mean, I, some of us have been patient since we were children, uh, as Michelle said, um, and, you know, you're, it, you're used to just having a great day and, you know, uh, telling everybody you're having a great day and, uh, and just assume, I think, the opposite uh, when when we're at those milestone points, um, we're not having a great day. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. No, that's really really helpful. And I do just want to do a shout out to a, a trial that we're doing actually um, in uh, um, in multiple individuals with different chronic conditions, but also in transplant. Just inspired by this need, and it it's a. a CBT spinoff, but also gives some mindfulness practices. So I'll put a, a link into there if we're actively recruiting right now to try and help support as well. That's amazing. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I, I will quickly mention, I know I think, yeah, we are running out of time, but another thing I, um, I do want to mention is just that um, oh, it just fell out of my head what it was. <laughs> um, no, it, okay. I'll, if it comes back before we end, I'll, I'll bring it up. I think it was related to a comment I just read to you. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. Just speaking of mental health and the professional um, access to services, what did you find really helped, Michelle? Like you, you got such a robust um, 
approach to how you've uh, managed your own, both informal and formal. And I guess I'm I'm asking what helped you from a more formal perspective so mm -hmm. we can also help with those things because we are really seeing lots of gaps in the system <laughs> and the rising of people's mental health concerns. And of course, mm -hmm. you know, you throw in like a chronic illness that you've had and you've coped with and then along with transplant and the complexity of it, just uh, just wanted to know what what you found easier or worked. Mm -hmm. Um, I think one of the things would be uh, being persistent. So I did have a renal psychiatrist. Um, her role was different than my psychologist was. And while I found she managed my medication needs, she didn't necessarily manage my like strategic needs. You know, she didn't go into certain um, therapy models and things like that. So she managed one side, but that's why I also had a psychologist um, but why, why I say being persistent is trying to find the right person for you, because a lot of people struggle with finding a good match and having somebody that that they can be open with that can provide them with the mental health support that they need. So my psychologist was more on the side of um, providing, you know, talk, asking the tough questions, uh, giving me a little bit of homework and um, really just you know, giving me, giving me the strategies or, you know, working with me to find things that, that would actually work for me. Um, and just, just be persistent with it and, and think about why you need to do this for yourself, who else you need to do it for. Um, but I know a big deterrent can be um, having, having, not having the connection with the person that you are speaking with in a, in a social worker, psychologist, counselor, therapist role, making sure you're finding the right one and not, not giving up when it doesn't, when it isn't a match, it's hard to tell your story over and over and over again, um, when you are trying to find the right person, uh, but, but they're out there and it's, it is, it's been a valuable thing for me and it still is to this day. Um, so just, you know, recognizing that it's out there, you just might have to track it down a little bit and take what you can from, from each professional that you're working with. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's some good comments and, uh, and uh, praise for your presentation, Michelle. Uh, thank you, John. Um, I'm definitely of the uh, outdoors and uh, physical activity journey. I think uh, Michelle's pressure to get back to swimming <laughs> underscored <laughs> that one as well. <laughs> yeah. Are there any other questions from the panel as we approach the top of the hour? Yeah, so thank you so much, Michelle. And as we wrap this up, if anybody else would like to, I'm sure Michelle, you'll, if there's some, um, some things that are posted uh, we expected to have a nice robust uh, response from our attendees here. So thank you all for your contribution. And we thank especially Michelle for her story and also highlighting the importance of tapping into mental health and all of those needs and just the whole journey that you've shared. It's just been very rich. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, everybody. And uh, yeah, thanks everybody for being here. I truly appreciate you um, sharing as well. Thank you so much, Michelle.